by noting several very specific things. Um, one of those being that environmental and economic justice, and as we integrate and continue this program this evening, and the intersections between climate change, global warming, um, punitive impact, health, and all those other issues uh, was redefined at the first People of Color Summit. So I, I just want to kind of kind of mention this. It's very, very important to us as grassroots as a grassroots organization, uh, but also in terms of our grassroots sisters and brothers, not only here in Albuquerque, but throughout the state of New Mexico and throughout this country. Um, as people know, um, and Cliff picks up on, this is the 30th anniversary of the first People of Color Summit. <laughs> Um, and so there's been a whole series of activities, and I want to note Madalena, um, who was one of the participants at the first People's Color Summit in Washington, D.C. in October of 1991. Um, and Sophia and several others, uh, several others of us uh, were present at that first People's Color Summit. Now, if we just take it back just for a very quick second and kind of ground ourselves about what we're going to do and what we're going to talk about this evening is that nothing has come easy in the struggle that we've been engaged in and we're specifically looking at systemic racism environmental racism and the intersections between policy and other pieces that are connected to that systemic racism that's very very important to us and those of us from new mexico those of us that are living here in new mexico know uh, that we have been in that struggle and in that battle for over 500 years uh, so that's the first thing just to just to note the other very quickly as we move on um, in this agenda is the first people of color summit. Um, and New Mexico had a very large delegation of participants at the first people of color summit. At the first people of color summit, we redefined environmentalism and conservationism. That's where we work, where we live, where we play, where we pray, and where we go to school. That's very, very important to the history of our movement and particularly the grassroots movement uh, within the environmental and economic justice movement. My others, as we said, and Cliff noted this, was the principles of environmental justice. Um, and then out of the second, there was many things that took place um, in that dialogue. 1,100 of us convened in Washington, DC in October of 1991. And then based upon that, there were several things that came out of the first people of color some. But I wanted to note one of those being uh, the principles of environmental justice. So I wanna kind of leave it there and move it on, but I just wanna, just wanna close with this comment. Um, and many of us in this room know each other, and many of us have been on opposite sides of table, on tables, and sometimes on the same side of those tables. But the very important thing for us to understand as we continue to engage here is that our movement is led by the grassroots. Um, and then based upon that, anything that we've engaged in, and this discussion will be this evening, um, was grounded from the bottom up. Uh, so wherever we go, as sisters and brothers, as ladies and gentlemen, wherever that may be, we will never forget those that have given up their lives to make it possible for us to be in this room. And that's very crucial to us. African-Americans, Latinos, Native Americans, and Asian Pacific Islander people. And then those other poor and working class communities throughout New Mexico, but also throughout this country. So I just wanted to lastly just say, thank you very much to the law school. Um, we've had incredible working relationships uh, with the law schools throughout these years. And we're looking forward and we thank those students uh, that really have dedicated their life and have worked with us and other grassroots groups throughout this period of time. So thank you very much. Um, and I'll pass it on. Thank you, for letting me uh, share the stage with these people who are, who know, know so much more than I do on this topic. Um, you know, I, I'm just here, I wanted to sort of share the city's perspective, especially since now we know we've got another four years to work on this stuff together. And I, I've been thinking a lot about the parallels between the work in the cumulative impact phase and the work that we're trying to do in police reform. And I mean, I really can't articulate it any better than, than Mr. Moore in terms of the, the history that they're both grounded in and the hundreds of years of struggle and police reform against the brutality of the state and in the environmental justice world as he just articulated. They both have culture change at the center of them. Uh, you know, for, for the police reform world, it's really about 
I'm doing a, a culture in an ethos that has been in interleaf interleafing world for hundreds of years. In, in this world, one of the cultural challenges that I perceive from, from my seat is the way we've so irrationally fragmented the way that we regulate land and water and health and all these other things um, that actually are all one system that needs to be considered together. And uh, they both also have this place where uh, there, seem, there seems to be a real struggle. There's these very basic principles that I think at least everybody in this room agrees with. You know, in the police world, the, the struggle in Albuquerque is pretty simple. Police should only use force when it's absolutely necessary. But to, to make that change, we have to understand the history and the health and the culture and the, the unique struggles of so many different parts of our community. In the cumulative impacts world, Again, my simplified view is that we have to make regulations in the real world, um, which again have to take into account the history and the struggles and the diversity and the unique aspects of so many different parts of our community. Uh, but where that, that vision seems to start to get bogged down is when we try to translate it into this quantitative and um, regulatory and analytical world. Uh, so, you know. One of my um, frustrations in the police world has been, you know, we spent a whole lot of time talking about how many hours of video, lapel video we watch, is it 50, is it 75? And I would so much rather spend that time on the much harder, much more people intensive work of uh, changing hearts and minds and teaching police officers how to de-escalate and how to talk to people. And these things that we so desperately need to do to actually make the change we want and, and in the uh, cumulative impacts world, it was like, you know, two years ago, we needed to pass the stringency standard and the city got behind it, we did it, and it was awesome. Um, and now there's a lot of conversation about do we have the right kind of baseline data to, to make the rules we want. And, and that's all, I get it and I respect it, but I feel that same frustration in my heart that we're not getting to what we know is the problem because everyone in this room could go to a map, so maybe I'll just stop there, could go to a map of the city and tell you exactly where the vulnerable communities are. And I would much so much rather spend the passion and intelligence and skill of the people in this room working on those bigger changes, um, even though, again, you know, utmost respect for the systems that we operate in. So I'm really just here to ask for all of your help. Um, you know, we have this moment where there is an alignment of values among the federal, state, and local levels of government. There is money flowing all over the place, for better or for worse. And it's not gonna last forever. None of these things is gonna last forever. And I, you know, I just feel a sense of urgency to help the city move forward on this issue of cumulative impacts way fast. And you know, my team will tell you, I'm always saying, gotta do more faster, right? Um, but that's how I feel about this too. We need your best thinking. We need your ideas from other parts of the world and the country. We need um, your technically uh, solid, solutions and, and ultimately we're going to need your public health support because truly the opposition to this stuff I don't even think has really had to organize um, because we we haven't had cumulative impacts analysis but when they do if it's anything like in the police reform world it's going to be a struggle we're going to need everyone in this room um, the people who've been working on it for a lifetime and the people who are brand new to the issues we're going to need all of your support to make the kind of bold change that that we really truly want to make and have been as frustrated maybe not as frustrated as you but a lot frustrated in the pace of how it has gone in the first 20 years um so thank you so much for coming together thank you for both of you for being interested and uh to the professor for coming out here to the law school um and uh we just really appreciate you and thank you Buenas noches. On behalf of the law school clinic and the law school environmental law clinic and Los Angeles, thank you all for being here tonight. I think we've been through a traumatic day today with the election. And, uh, you know, it's always a, a time to calm ourselves. Some of, some of us have won, some of us have lost. And uh, for me and for Los Jardines, we have to just basically say that oftentimes uh, we need to real, be real conscious of the fact that some things aren't landslides 
but rather choice. As people of color, we are often ultimately don't have any choice in, in our leadership, right? So that's why it's important. One of the mantras of the environmental justice movement is we speak for ourselves. So whether it comes to any uh, professional field, we expect when they talk about environmental justice, that people of color be right there, that those communities be there to speak for themselves, right? And so that's hard with our government officials because as Richard says, we've had executive orders for 30 years, but we've had no laws. So that in itself speaks, speaks volumes, right? So we're very happy to have you all here. We're really happy with the expertise that uh, Dr. Sheets brings to us. And, um, you know, cumulative impacts are exactly all those. And the police is part of that cumulative impact, right? Because it's not just the toxicity that we face in Mountain View and San Jose and in different parts throughout Albuquerque, right? Because New Mexico, again, on Saturday, um, on KUNM during Rosa Comunistas, we'll be interviewing uh, the downwinders, also survivors of the nuclear legacy that New Mexico is part of, right? We are the cycle of the nuclear, uh, where the nuclear sacrifice state from the production of uranium to the production of the atomic bomb to the testing on the Trinity waste site to the five routes that coming to New Mexico bringing in US uh, nuclear waste to whip the only garbage of nuclear waste in the country, right? So we're very clear in what our uh, role and our goals and our uh, tactics and strategies are as, as a community grassroots organization, right? And again, we're very uh, happy to see all of you here. We're very happy to offer these uh, types of educationals and we hope that we are able to really create a group of people that's really interested in climate justice, environmental justice, but not on the back of people of color, not on the back of poor people across the world, right? And I, I guess I'm a little emotional about that because the COP is happening right now, right? And a lot of people are in Europe and talking about this issue. And once again, a lot of those issues that were moving quickly, oftentimes have the unintended consequences of hurting the majority of people that aren't necessarily the privilege, right? So with that, that's kind of uh, what we want you all to think about in terms of listening today and really thinking about what are all those cumulative impacts, not just toxicity and contamination, but lack of mental health services, lack of good transportation, uh, lack of uh, good police oversight, right? And those kinds of things. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Professor Villa, and thank you, Professor Keith. Welcome, Dr. Treats. Thank you. I have two things to say before I start. Wish that he would remind me. Sorry, okay. There you go. Two things to say before I start. You, uh, you uh, missed the thing worse than death because uh, you know, as you get older, you can't see. <laughs> so we had this all initially, and I couldn't see the little button. And then the music came on. And I started to sing. So, uh, I'm glad I was able to turn it off before before I started to sing. You would that would not have been pretty very pretty for you. And the second thing is it got me in a very good mood. Marvin Gaye and Al Green, yeah. Stevie Wonder. And the second thing I want to say is that when I was a young man, I was um, a public figure, so I saw the criminal justice system up, you know, up close. And I'm not going to technology clip my. Um, oh. so you have to help me to get my presentation up there. Yes. Well, you know, with the whole criminal justice system is. I was a public defender back in um, mid 80s, 19, 1980s, and talking about the same issues. We, we at one point we, we wouldn't even put a I, okay I'm getting off topic y'all <laughs> but we, we we wouldn't even send our investigators out to um, to stop on the New Jersey Turnpike because we were afraid that um, we were afraid the police might uh, um, put drugs in plant drugs in 
And we're, you know, we're trying to figure out how to address the disproportionate number of stops. And then we just go ahead. Okay. Different topic, deeply important topic here. They definitely have been done. So, first, let me thank um, Rosa Venus Institute. Richard Sophia, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, Professor Villa, good, thanks for inviting me here, University of Mexico Law School. Uh, here is a game plan for, for my talk tonight. And um, let me first apologize somewhat because this is, this is basically the same talk I gave last April when I wasn't in person. So it doesn't hurt if you heard it before, you hear it again, maybe it'll make more sense this time. <laughs> Uh, and if you haven't heard it before, uh, I hope I hope I, my, my first goal is not to put anybody to sleep tonight. That's the first. Um, and a little bit of new stuff at the end on the cumulative impacts law in New Jersey. And we can talk more about that in, um, in questions too. So we're going to do cumulative impacts 101 a little bit. And then we're going to talk about um, the uh, cumulative impacts policies at the New Jersey EJ Alliance. And I'm part of New Jersey Easy Alliance as well. I work at Kane University, but I'm also part of New Jersey Easy Alliance. The uh, municipal policy that we develop and the uh, statewide policy, the Lone Ally. And then we'll talk about the new cumulative impact law that was uh, adopted last August in New Jersey. So here's a definition of cumulative impacts that we use a lot in New Jersey. Now, there are various definitions of cumulative impact. This is kind of a compilation that we put together, um, formal definition. And this, so we can say cumulative impacts is the risk and impacts caused by multiple pollutants and the risk and impacts caused by these pollutants both in isolation and when they interact with other pollutants and social vulnerabilities that exist in the community. And usually the uh, multiple pollutants are emitted by multiple sources of pollution in the in the neighborhood. And cumulative impacts has been a very difficult, really recalcitrant problem to address. And, you know, it may be, I'm turning to Richard Sophia now, it, it may be the premier issue in, in the EJ community. How do you deal with multiple sources of pollution? Because unfortunately, many of our communities um, have them. So a couple of reasons why it's been a difficult problem to address. One is because in our country, we try to address we try to regulate pollution by setting individual standards. Right? So we, we go from pollutant to, to pollutant, we set a standard. And the problem with that from an EJ perspective, from an environmental justice perspective, is that there can be detrimental health impacts even if no individual standards violated. Um, so a typical issue in the community, I'll take, I'll, I'll take a real issue that happened in, in New Jersey where uh, Hess, Hess oil company wanted to build a power plant in Newark. And Newark has been recognized by the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection as being an area that, that suffers from cumulative impacts. Um, and the community said, we have more than our fair share of polluting facilities already in Newark. But the response that the community got from both state and federal government is, well, we don't see that any individual standards being violated. And the modeling was done by the company, by the way. So we can't really help you. And what's the community say? They say, well, but you're not taking into account super pollution, all these multiple pollutants, right? Because as we breathe in these pollutants, it's not like we have partitions in our, I'm sorry, all the savers. Don't look at the last one, see? So you won't know that I say the same thing all the time. Um, you know, they, they say, well, we, we don't have partitions in our lungs. It's not like the particulate matter goes one place and the sulfur dioxide goes in another compartment. They all mix together, but you're not taking that into account. Um, and the more the, the bottom line of the story is that um, the power plant is now operating in Newark. Another problem with cumulative impacts, addressing cumulative impacts, is the correlation between pollution in our society and race and income. I know this looks like a boring graph, but it's really pretty exciting or in a perverse way, exciting in kind of a perverse way. Um, and, but this shows 
why some of us in this room are um, environmental justice advocates. So this was made by New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, not by us crazy EJ folks. And in 2009, and the first thing they did was assign a cumulative impact score to every neighborhood in New Jersey. And then they asked the question, oh, in this case, you can think of cumulative impacts as a very rough estimate of the total amount of pollution in the neighborhood. So they, they assign a cumulative impact score to every neighborhood. And then they say, well, what's the relationship between race and income? They graphed it. And so you see the relationship here. Uh, depending on how I feel that day, I'll call it a disturbing relationship, a troubling relationship. If I'm feeling really bad, I call it an unholy relationship. Um, let's go with disturbing tonight. Uh, look, look at the top figure. You see, there's a number of people of color in New Jersey neighborhood increases. What happens to the estimate of the amount of pollution in New Jersey neighborhood? It goes up, right? And the same thing for living for people living in poverty in New Jersey. The number of people living in poverty in the neighborhood increases, so the amount of cumulative impacts. So I'll say what I say all over the country. I show this graph so much, my colleagues in New Jersey uh, tease me about it. Um, but I'm just happy to be able to show it to show it again. Uh, this is providing you evidence that if you live in New Jersey, the amount of pollution in your neighborhood is connected to race and income, to the color of your skin. The amount of money in your pocket, and this goes against everything that at least we claim we stand for in the country and in the state of New Jersey. And of course, the thing we're worried about is we strongly suspect there's some evidence this is this, this is connected to the health disparities that are rooted in race and income that we also see in our country. And this is not just a New Jersey problem, you have to say that. If other states did similar investigations, many of them would probably have similar findings. And in fact, one of the things that started the EJ movement back in the 1980s were several national reports that did have, that did find, um, find some, find, have similar findings to the graphs you see here. So in New Jersey, and not just in New Jersey, but around the country, this has spurred environmental justice groups to develop policies. To address cumulative impacts. So in New Jersey, we've addressed two policies, we've um, developed two policies, one on municipal levels, municipal ordinance, and another is a statewide policy. So I'm going to talk about both of them. I'll probably spend more time on the statewide policy than the municipal ordinance. So let's go through both of them quickly. Um, the municipal ordinance, I'm not sure why I put this slide in here, it just shows you the different names that, <laughs> as it developed. Right? So we spent um, the first thing we did was, and I'll go through a little bit of his, more history later, is we, we being New Jersey EG Alliance, Kingdom of Impacts Committee, the second one we formed, we spent a year developing um, the model municipal ordinance. At the same time, we also developed a statewide, statewide policy. And it's been adopted by the biggest city in um, New Jersey, which is Newark. Newark is 88% of color, so it's about right here, somewhere in here. So you can see the estimate of the disproportionate amount of pollution right, in Newark. I didn't say, when I say EJ communities, I mean the communities only right on the screen, low-income communities and communities of color. So Newark is definitely safely one of those communities that have disproportionate amount of cumulative impacts. And this adopted the um, municipal ordinance. Now, second, several primary features. One is that the city has to um, put together what we call a natural resource index. It's basically almost kind of a classic EJ study where it shows a uh, source of pollution um, and says how much of pollution and the demographics in the area. And the ordinance says it has to be updated every two years. Newark actually just finished it last spring, I think. Which was quite accomplished. It's not like the cities have a whole lot of resources to do it, right? So we intentionally said do it with existing resources. We don't expect you to go out and do primary research, you know, collect new information. And here's who the ordinance applies to. Uh, basically, any if basically if you want to bring a new industrial or commercial activity to Newark, then you're going to have to say, what 
what type of pollution you're going to admit, and how much of it. And there's a short checklist for commercial activity and a longer list that goes a little bit beyond just the pollutants you're going to admit for industrial activity. Um, along with that, the zone, zoning ordinance, this is not part of the law, but along with that, community groups, EJ groups in Newark, um, actually managed to get zoning ordinance changed to make some uses conditional. Uh, one of the main authors of this, one of my co-colleagues, Donald Bautista, is at the New School, played a large role in Alabama Community Corporation, uh, also played a large role in, in this. Let me be transparent. We're not satisfied with the municipal ordinance. Um, you know, for, for because it's on the city level, it's hard to say you're just going to deny things. So, really, what we're trying to do with the ordinance is give people more information and hopefully, the information comes power. And we want the residents of Newark to know what, what pollution will come from these new activities, as well as the staff in Newark. Right, the councils, the zoning council, and, um, the um, whatever council they have. They have so many of them, I can't, so many I can't remember any of them. <laughs> but we want them to have the information so we think that people will make better decisions then about whether new activity will be good for Newark or not. But we don't think it's working as well as we thought. We don't really know because we have to analyze it. And so so we, we, we this, is the, this is what we're talking about. The, He's in community in New Jersey. So we're you know, trying to get resources so we can look at the ordinance, really analyze how well it's doing. And if if need be, um, change the ordinance. But I should say this was this was a, a really um, bottom-up process. You know, the New Jersey EG, EG Alliance is an alliance of several organizations. And so we put the, together the ordinance based on the things that the communities have experienced around the state. And then in Newark, we started it with a community meeting. And it took three years. And we have the model municipal ordinance. And if you look at the model municipal ordinance we gave to Newark, and then the ordinance that was passed after it was rewritten by the residents of Newark, it looks very different. <laughs> but the main points are the same. So we're, you know, we're going to have to go through a similar process when we analyze it. So it's important to have you know, the residents and the community organizations in Newark involved in this from, from the beginning. And we'll try to maintain that involvement um, you know, as we analyze the ordinance. Okay, statewide policy. So the little girl, you see, I like that picture. Uh, the little girl's a member of an, EGA, of an EGA community. So our statewide policy starts off by saying, identify environmental justice and overburdened communities. Now, there, those are two different communities or two different definitions for communities, but there'll be a lot of overlap. Many EJ communities, if not most, will be overburdened with pollution, but not necessarily all. And not all overburdened communities will be EJ communities. Now, EJ communities, we usually define that just based solely on race and income. So you identify these communities, and then you're going to say, we're going to protect them from new sources of pollution. By saying that if you're uh, seeking a pollution permit, we're only going to give it to you, a major pollution permit, we're only going to give it to you if you can show you're not going to add pollution to that neighborhood. And you can show that by two ways. You can show that either by saying you're not going to have any emissions, or you're going to offset more than offset your emissions by reducing pollution somewhere else in that neighborhood. Now, the key there is it has to be in that neighborhood. You can't be in Albuquerque building something and say we're going to offset it in Santa Fe. That won't work. And we're going to talk more about offsets later. And we're going to reduce pollution in the neighborhood by saying if you have a major pollution permit that's coming up for renewal, and I'm, I'm most familiar with um, air permits, they come up every five years, I think. You're not going to get that permit renewed unless you can show you're going to reduce pollution in that neighborhood one of two ways. Reduce your own emissions or pollute or reduce emissions somewhere else in the neighborhood in that neighborhood. And we're going to provide quality of life incentives. That's a euphemism for money. Um, and we're going to provide funds to try to attract non-polluting industry 
into the neighborhoods and we still want economic development. We want economic development in those neighborhoods. We don't think it's a contradiction to address cumulative impacts and have economic development at the same time. It takes some planning. Uh, and we want to make sure that there is ample supply of fresh, affordable food and there's ample green space and a couple other things. Now, look, um, you know, this is kind of a, an outline of what the policy would be. And we would expect that details would be filled in by whatever easy organization is trying to get the policy passed. You have to put a timetable on it. Um, you have to decide uh, how you figure out your baseline. You have to decide whether you use offsets. Some EDA communities may say we don't want we don't want the offsets in there. And we still think it would work even without that. Now I made it um, a mission of mine. I shouldn't say this way, but I'll say it. It keeps you going, but hold, hold you accountable. It's uh, <laughs> how accountable I am. I, I wrote a um, a short memo on this about three pages back in 2011. And it's been my mission ever since to write a longer paper on it. The first draft is done. <laughs> So me and my colleague, um, Ana Baptista, will be the authors of it. And I'm trying to get a second draft of it done uh, by Christmas. And, and hopefully it will influence, um, you know, give people thoughts on the state level and also on the national level. So here's a little history of cumulative impacts in New Jersey. When we first started talking about this issue, well, the first I can remember is back in 2007. I still remember, I don't know why this is burning to my memory so much, but we were in Camden, in South Jersey, across from Philly. And we said, this is a New Jersey Easy Alliance meeting. And we said, you know, we're going to have to address cumulative impacts because we don't, no one else will. Right, so we formed our first cumulative impact committee. And um, it wasn't just New Jersey Easy Alliance. We had other uh, allies in it. ICC was on about community corporation, part of the alliance, Clean Water Action. Eastern Environmental Law Center, and about half of, half of the um, New Jersey Easy Advisory Council was from our organization, New Jersey Easy Alliance. So we thought working with the council would be a good way to publicize the issue. So we actually had the council hold a hearing on it and write a paper, write a report on it. And the result of that were the graphs that you saw. The graphs were produced by a screening tool the New Jersey DEP, DEP, I'll give them credit, actually put together you know, as a result of this of this early work. But then we kind of hit um, we kind of hit the roadblock and we dissolved that committee. I can't remember why, but we just, we just let it go. Uh, we never were able, we, we, we were never able to get the statewide policy actually put, you know, actually put in place and implemented. Although, in, and I think I have the dates here wrong, I think it's 2009, 2010, that statewide cumulative impacts bill. Um, I think that was more like 2012. I'll have to go back and look again. There was an initial cumulative impacts bill in New Jersey that we supported. It didn't come from us. It came from, came from the senior female, um, I think, legislator in the state. She was a senator. But, we were the only one talking about cumulative impacts in the state. <laughs> so, so she must have been provoked by us. But we supported it, but it didn't go anywhere. And it just disappeared. The next thing that happened was that it, well, we developed our, you know, we, we had developed our policies already by then, actually, in 2012. And we kept talking about the policy. Uh, the statewide policy was submitted to EPA, New Jersey DEP, but no one, no one did on it. Until 2017, Senator Booker, who's our senator, came to us with the cumulative impacts law. Now, when he came to us, it didn't have cumulative impacts in it. So we said, well, if you're going to do an EJ bill, you've got to have cumulative impacts in it. And by the way, we have a statewide cumulative impacts policy. And so we gave it to them. And they incorporated it into the bill. He gave it to the legislative council, the rest of the legislative council. But they didn't incorporate it quite exactly how we had it. So it's kind of a different version of, um, of our statewide cumulative impact policy. But, uh, and I'm skipping over some, I'll go back. But it was the first time that we know of 
that there's actually a policy in the law that said you should turn down permits based on cumulative impacts and environmental justice. And um, Richard and Sophia play a role in that law, an important role, because uh, EJHA, Richard is, uh, I, don't, I don't know if he said this, co, co chair of Environmental Justice Health Alliance. It's a national EJHA organization, and we organized national calls and got a lot of input into, into that um, law. And the reason we did it was we knew the law wasn't going to be passed during the Trump administration. But we thought it was a good way to uh, keep up discussion about EJ and maybe affect state policy. And there, we were taking somewhat of a chance, ask us about that later, and we can talk about you know, the chance we were taking, but we decided to go forward with it. And in fact, that's probably what happened in New Jersey. Um, a hero of ours now, and so I've got to change this, to put his name, put his name up here, um, Simon Singleton. In South Jersey, decided to revive the bill. And we're pretty sure he was influ influenced. I've never asked him directly. But I'm pretty sure he was influenced by the work we did. Because some, because initially some parts of the state law were just verbatim from, from the Brooker bill that we worked on. <laughs> so I was influenced by it. And that was in 2018. And we worked, we worked on the bill with him until 2020 when it was passed. So here, here are the guts, here's the guts, here are the guts of the New Jersey Community Impact Law. So the federal law was submitted, but not passed. So a new version of it has been submitted. And another law brought by Representative McEachin and Rahava also incorporated cumulative impact in it. So there are at least two laws, federal laws out there that have cumulative impact in it and say that pollution permits should be denied based on cumulative impacts, but neither has been adopted yet. The New Jersey law is the only law that we know of that's been adopted that says you must, you must deny permits under some circumstances based on cumulative impacts, environmental justice. So the first thing the law does is define overburdened communities. And it says if a census block group is either 40% of color or 35% low income, right? Or its residents, or 40% of its residents are of limited English capacity, then that would be considered an overburdened community. Now, we messed up on that a little bit because that's really defined in the Bible of Justice community because it's using just race and income linguistic. It does not have uh, a pollution indicator in the definition. But that's all right. Well, we should have changed that, but we were so happy to get a law. You know, we were like, whatever you want to call it, we're, we're cool. But in retrospect, I think it sometimes will confuse it. Then the law says if you want a major pollution permit in one of these overburdened communities, you have to do an EJ analysis. And the EJ analysis has to determine if granting the pollution permit would cause cumulative environmental and public health stressors in the uh, census block group where the proposed facility will be located, cause those stressors will be higher in that block group than in other block groups in the state. And if the answer to that is yes, it would cause stressors to be higher, cumulative stressors, then if you're asking for a new permit, it shall be denied. That's what the law says, shall. If the permit you're asking for is for renewal or for an expansion of the facility, even if it causes higher stressors, it won't be, it can't be denied, but conditions can be placed on the permit. By the way, in the EJ bill from Senator, Book, Senator Booker's office, renewals would be denied if there's a disproportionate impact. So that's really the guts of the bill. Um, here's the language about the EJ analysis. We grant the permit cause or contribute to adverse cumulative environmental and public health stressors in the overburdened community that are higher. If they're higher, then that's considered to be a disproportionate impact. Uh, here are your environmental and public health stressors, and the pollution you might expect, 
on air pollution, all types of pollution, and importantly, conditions that might cause potential public health impacts. Okay. Yes, um, the law does require a public hearing for so the public can uh, talk about the ask questions of the opinion and talk about the EJ analysis. And where we are right now is that uh, BEP is developing um, regulations to implement the law. And the regulations are going to be just as important as the law. Okay. It's fine to say, will the permit cause cumulative public health and environmental stress to be higher than the black groups and other black groups? But what the hell does that mean? Okay. How are you going to do that? So we've been hanging in there. We've been having discussions with DEP, as have other groups, for the last year. And for us, you know, we're small environmental organizations. Well, at least NJAJ is small, two staff people, okay? a lot of volunteers. Um, this takes up a lot of our time, but we were determined to hang in there with them. They had six public sessions, and we talked to them a lot about every other reason. And, you know, I'll give them credit for doing a whole lot of work. And they were talking to a broad range of people, right? So they did a, a lot of work on this. And the, the regulation will determine what stressors we're talking about. They come up with 31 stressors. I should have that in the slide. It's going to do it. How you compare the stressors in the block group where the facility will be located to other block groups. And what is the unit of comparison? Um, I will not go into what they decided. I do have a slide ready if you really want to talk about it. It's not that technically difficult, but it can be confusing. We have suggested to them, we being the New Jersey EJ community, that they use the California screening tool, um, Cal Virus Screen, because it's been really vetted a lot. But they decided to go on their own. And the, the Cal Virus Screen computes. A, a cumulative impact score, an overall cumulative impact score for every census tract in New Jersey, uh, in California. New Jersey, DEP decided not to do that. They decided what they would do would be to compare the stressors in the block group where the facility would be located to stressors in um, the other block groups in the state. So they're comparing each of those stressors, each of those individual stressors. But not coming up with a total cumulative impact score. So I'll close by saying this. You know, we're really excited about the law. We think it's going to move us forward. But we understand that it's not a silver bullet. Right? It's going to help, we think, significantly help, but it's not going to address the, the entire cumulative impacts problem in New Jersey. So we think there's going to have to be a suite of policies to address cumulative impacts. And we're, we're, what we've been saying is that there are going to be two different categories of policies. One will be policies like this that address cumulative impacts directly through the concept of cumulative impact. But other strategies will address the different types of pollution that go into making up that disproportionate pollution load that you've seen. And um, in particular, we've been We've been uh, advocating for a while the climate change mitigation policy to be used not only to fight climate change, but to guarantee reductions in the disproportionate pollution load in the EJ community. Maybe we'll talk about that in the future. So, the term we've come up with is we're going to need cumulative policies to address cumulative impact. So, we think this is a good beginning, but it won't be the end. But that is the end of my talk. So thank you. Questions? Well, thank you, Dr. Sheets. Before we uh, jump to the Q&A, and I know we're very excited to do that, we have one more short presentation from Nelson Sona um, from the city attorney's office. So we'll just provide a little bit of the uh, regulatory framework that we're talking about here so that we have sort of a common understanding of sort of the regulatory scheme for 
our, uh, our city, our county, our state. And then we are right on time, actually. We'll go into Q&A after that. So, Kelsey, thank you so much for joining us, another distinguished graduate of this law school, and take it away. Thank you. Um, I don't know, it's pretty PowerPoint, so I'm going to keep it really short. I have not presented with a mask on before, so if I get too quiet, it's like, give me the thumbs up, like, say, be louder. Kelsey, please. <laughs> um, I'm really honored to be here tonight. I, um, as Professor Via said, am the Assistant City Attorney for the Air Quality Program for the City of Albuquerque. I personally have a deep respect for environmental justice, and it really gives me great pleasure to be in a position where I can address it locally. Unfortunately, though, tonight I get to give the really boring presentation and not talk about EJ, but to talk a little bit about the regulatory structure and history of air quality um, regulations here in Albuquerque and Bernalillo County. So, um, Albuquerque has been at the forefront of air quality regulation since the 1950s. At that time, the city commissioners were mostly concerned with point sources like tiki burners in the North Valley sawmill area. Even though it was really common to have open burning and to use wood burning for residential heat. Um, so all of that was contributors to local air pollution back then. In 1955, the city council adopted an ordinance to address point sources, but they didn't allocate any resources to help address it. And so the regulatory objectives weren't achieved and the law was not in place. In 1962, Bernalillo County began working on its own ordinance. And around the same time is when the city did start actively enforcing its existing ordinance against open burning sand and gravel operations, and asphalt mix plants. It was in 1963 that attempts to adopt a state statute for air quality regulation started, but it wasn't until 67 that we got the New Mexico Air Quality Control Act. And interestingly, something I didn't know was that that law was drafted by city officials um, and was that draft was what was used to introduce it to the state legislature. And they use the Albuquerque program as a model for the law. Uh, the law delegated municipalities the authority to enact local air pollution control ordinances um, and to establish local air quality control boards. So in 1967, the city and county decided to work together and they adopted parallel ordinances that were identical pursuant to the new authority granted by the state. And they put the city in charge of administering and enforcing those laws. In 1970, we had the Federal Clean Air Act amendments, and that gives us the legal structure that we're familiar with today for air quality regulation through federal law. And, you know, here locally, we have a pretty unique regulatory program it's organized more like the state level programs that you see and not really like the local and regional programs that most states have. The local jurisdiction we have extends throughout Albuquerque and Bernalillo County, except tribal lands. The rest of the state is regulated by the New Mexico Environmental Department and the Environmental Improvement Board. Here locally, uh, we have two bodies that have a similar structure to the state. We have the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Air Quality Board. Um, some of the members of that board are actually here with us tonight. So thank you so much for being here. We also have um, the Albuquerque Bernalillo County Joint Air Quality Program, such a mouthful, <laughs> which is administered by the City of Albuquerque Environmental Health Department. And that's similar to the New Mexico Environmental Department when you're looking at how the layers work out. Additionally, we have the Albuquerque Environmental Health Department Director, who has delegated their authority to the Air Quality Division Deputy Director, Mara Alana Burstein, who is here tonight. And uh, she performs the same as the NMED Secretary does under the state act. I did try and make a nice, beautiful chart for you all, but it turned into a maze. 
So if anyone has questions, I'm happy to follow up more about those pictures. Uh, a little bit more about the bodies that we do have. So the Air Board is an appointed volunteer citizen board that's created by our local ordinances. We have four members appointed by the city and three members appointed by the county. We also have the County Planning Commission and the City Environmental Planning Commission who are allowed to appoint a liaison each uh, to be non-voting members on that board. The Air Board has two main roles. They're a quasi-legislative or rulemaking body, and they're also quasi-adjudicatory and judicial. In their rulemaking role, the Air Board adopts, amends, or appeals air quality rules and standards consistent with the state law uh, to comply with the Federal Clean Air Act and the National Ambient Air Quality Standards and to prevent or abate air pollution. Interesting, the local uh, Air Board regulations are treated differently than most municipal and county regulations because they're actually published in the New Mexico Administrative Code, uh, just like state agency regulations are. So you'll find the um, Environmental Improvement Board's regulations there, and you will also find our local board regulations in the Administrative Code. Or administrative code. In its judicial role, the Air Board hears and decides appeals of the air quality program permitting decisions. And if a party wants to appeal an Air Board decision, they go straight to the New Mexico Court of Appeals. The Air Board's authority is limited by federal and state law, uh, the local ordinances that are identical, and further by its own regulations that it adopts and its bylaws. So for example, um, when they're looking to adopt the rule, the state law states that the factors the Air Board has to consider are the character and degree of injury to or interference with health, welfare, visibility, and property, the public interest, including the social and economic value of the sources and subjects of air contaminants, and the technical practicability and economic reasonableness of reducing or eliminating air contaminants from sources involved and previous experience with equipment and methods available to control the air contaminants involved. So three factors. Additionally, federal and state law allow for um, state authorities or the federal EPA to step in and enforce the regulations in certain circumstances. The Air Board um, is also a little bit different than other Air Boards. They don't have supervisory functions mm -hmm. over the Environmental Health Department or the Air Program, unlike other boards like in California, which do have their own staff. But we do provide staff support to the Air Board, um, and that is set out in the identical city and county ordinances. And the Air Board does have its own legal counsel as well. So I'm counsel for the program, and they have their own attorney that sits to advise them. For the program, um, at a really high level, because there's a lot that we do, we implement and enforce the air quality laws. So we oversee air quality permitting, investigating air quality violations, and requiring sources that are deemed out of compliance to comply, enforcing permitting agreements, operating a sophisticated ambient air monitoring network, which you may have seen in the news recently with our new air monitoring trailer, very exciting. Uh, overseeing a vehicle emissions testing program, which is a program that we only have locally. It's not uh, statewide, it's just here in Bernalillo County. Managing an air emissions inventory from all permitted equipment, developing new and amended air quality regulations, uh, to protect public health and presenting them for consideration by the Air Board and the EPA. We also issue permits to limit emissions from stationary sources, and those permits allow businesses to operate within the limits for protecting public health and natural resources 
that we currently have set under our existing law. And just with the Air Board, our authority too is also limited by the other laws. So federal law, state law, identical local ordinances, uh, and the regulations that the Air Board adopts all limit what we can do. And just with them, the state authorities or the EPA could step in in certain circumstances and take over enforcing our regulations. That being said, we do have a lot of powerful authority given our unique status and unique structure under state law. And we can address uh, quite a lot of clean air planning and regulation matters. However, we don't have the authority to get into some of the land use and development um, issues. Things like zoning regulation lie with the city planning department and for the greater Bernalillo County outside of the city, jurisdiction is with the Bernalillo County Planning and Development Department. And then the last thing I wanted to touch on, um, so we can get to the questions and not be bored, is just as Sarita mentioned, uh, recently we've had some really exciting and big changes to the New Mexico Air Act. So this past legislative session, there were numerous changes made and one of those was to explicitly authorize city council and the county commissioner to adopt air quality ordinances that are more stringent than federal law. Previously, we didn't have that authority. Um, and this is also the same authority that's given to the Air Board. So their regulations too can also be more stringent than federal law. Um, when adopting that, the standard is that the more stringent law must be based on substantial evidence that the proposed ordinance or regulation will be more protective of public health and the environment than federal law. We haven't adopted anything new yet to put that to the test. Um, we do have plans in the works to do a clean diesel fuel uh, standard regulation. And so I think that might be something that's being talked about being planned that would be sort of our first test of how we can, can do that. Um, but it's exciting. So thank you very much for your time, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kelsey. Thank you, everyone. This is now your turn. Um, so questions for anyone, um, Nikki or anyone, just please raise your hand and I'll just call people as I see it. Yes. Uh, thank you. And I apologize. I came down after work and I wasn't satisfied. So, <laughs> I mean, okay. uh, so we may have addressed this in the earlier part of the presentation. I don't know if there's a question for the doctor to address the one. So in New Jersey, do are there any renewable portfolio standards that apply to your electric utility? Nikki, it might help if you could repeat the question briefly for people who are also on the phone. Thank you. So the question is, in New Jersey, are there, is there a renewable portfolio standard? Are there, um, I would say, my translation of this, decarbonization laws? And uh, did you have a third one, third combo? That's why I say that. They're like corporate um, yeah. goals that aren't mandated by law or policy, but it's part of their like, commitment to their shareholders. Okay, so it's a climate change mitigation question, which I'm happy to answer. We're working on that also. Um, there is a renewable energy standard. Um, I can't remember the details of it to you. Off, uh, can't give you the details offhand. Uh, uh, I know it's there though because we're fighting one part of it that says that um, incinerators should get credit for renewable energy, which drives us up one wall and down the other. Um, <laughs> For climate change mitigation policy, New Jersey is part of two things, part of REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which the EJ community opposes, by the way, 
because of the carbon trading system and in general EJ organization against carbon trading system. Um, one of the reasons is because they don't guarantee that I was talking about the emission reductions that we want EJ community. They don't guarantee them. You might do it, you might not. But we want a system that guarantees those reductions. But New Jersey is part of that system. And New Jersey has another law called the Global, Global Warming Response Act, which also sets some standards. So we, we as an EJ community, are working to, we call it a mandatory emission reduction policy that we've come up that says that if you are a power plant located in the EJ community, you would have to reduce emissions. Um, whether, you know, no matter what kind of policy you're under, whether it's a market based mechanism like carbon trading or regulatory regime, you will have to reduce the emissions, which is you know, different than uh, carbon trading or carbon tax regime. We don't necessarily have to reduce emissions under, under those. So far, we have gotten no response, even though we met with the state government about two years ago. So we haven't given up. We're gonna, we're gonna do another organizing campaign and, and try again. We, we learned a lesson that, um, I guess we knew it, but this reinforces it. We need to do some grassroots organizing where people can enjoy it. So hopefully, you know, we're gonna, we're trying to do some more organizing and then present that policy again. Next. And that's the kind of policy that I'm talking about that we think we need in addition to cumulative impact measures. We need those types of policies also. So, oh, pretty well. <laughs> All right. Um, I just had a question about, I guess, a couple of questions. One was, did the municipal Policy or playing to the practical state level of the law on mm -hmm. the impact of the strategy there? Is there a more encouraging member for the state or effective impact on Actually, that was kind of the strategy because when we came up with the policies, we were in um, a more conservative government. When we first started working on cumulative impacts, the screening tool that produced that graph mm -hmm. was a more progressive government. Okay, stop with the youth uh, The Democrats were in power then. <laughs> then the Republicans came to power, and we knew we, we would not be able to get a statewide law passed. So we decided to do a city by city strategy. But you know, what happened was we just didn't have the capacity to do other cities besides New York. That took us three years and, and took up all our capacity. So we planned to go city by city and then come up, you know, then do a statewide law even though the substance of the law was different. So we, we kind of jumped over the city by city approach. We got in Newark, but then we got the opportunity to do the state, you know, to have a statewide law and, and we took it. And I guess the follow-up question I had was in terms of, um, you know, the, the impact of this policy, is it Initially, go back to 2007, and we were going around the state. Um, another colleague of mine, do you know Peter Montague? Me and Peter Montague were going around the state, and we were trying to come up with data. <laughs> you know, what, is there data for this? And um, that kind of led to the uh, the screening tool. You know, the the graph that I, that I showed you. Although what we kind of decided in the end was that. You know, if you have race and income, you probably really got it. You know, the other stuff can refine it, but boy, race and income is such a powerful indicator that you probably have it. Now, that's a policy, not from the legal point of view. <laughs> Legally, it's very different. And, 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 and Richard and I, well, those are here, and NJJA are both part of the Equitable and Just National Climate Platform. And we're going to come out with a policy very soon about the definition of the EJF community. And, and we are worried about race in that, in that instance. But for the cumulative impacts laws, um, 
you know, by the time we got traction, we 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 weren't as worried about that. Then we 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 made the argument that the argument that we kept getting from government, from scientists was we can't do this scientifically. We don't know how, we don't know how to do this. And we said, well, you know, you can't do nothing though. And we want you to know that by doing nothing, you're making a scientific decision. You know, they were saying, well, we don't know how to interact. And, but, you know, we said, but by doing nothing, you're saying it doesn't interact. So by default, you're making a scientific decision. And it's your duty to protect the public health. That's supposed to be what you're doing. And if you're conceding, this is what you did, this guy can help you guys, you need to do something. Now, since then, California developed a screening tool. New Jersey had a screening tool. And they came up with methods to, you know, to do this, to come up with, with, with some kind of measure of cumulative impacts. Um, and, you know, we, 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 we think that part is pretty solid, but it'll be tested. We have no doubt that uh, we're going to have lawsuits both on the definition of overburdened communities, because we use race and income, and on what, what you're talking about, whether, you know, I've been trying to think of what would the lawsuit say? I don't know. Is it a taking without due process? I'm not, you know, <laughs> but, you know, I'm not going to think about it too much. We'll know in the bottom. I mean, we're, we're kind of focused on, on, we're kind of focused on the race and income part now, and we're ready to kind of jump in and defend that. And we'll see what the other part is. But I have to say, one reason New Jersey decided not to do a cumulative impact score, total cumulative impact score for the census block group is because I think they think that it is more defensible to just count up the individual, to look at the individual stresses. They think the data supports that more than a total cumulative impact score. The state would look bad if they did that. Well, the California tool, though, has been vetted. No, I mean, a lot of areas would come out badly yeah. if, if they did it all of them. It would make the state look bad because a lot of people oh, well, are bad off a lot yeah. of areas are. Well, it's interesting you say that, but um, even with this, though, a large part, I mean, over and communities are a large part of the state. Yeah. But remember, then there's a second part. Get put, you know, they said you got to go through the pollution part of it. And, um, you know, you know, business, we knew business wouldn't like it, but I was on a panel with someone before, uh, with someone from business a couple of weeks ago. He said, but we can't, we can't put, we don't have places to put these things. And so, I, you know, I said, well, wait a minute. You can put it in the other more than half of the state. If you want to put it, and I named the kind of ritzy areas of the state, go ahead and try. You know, have at it. There's nothing that says that you can't. But I thought that was so revealing. He said, well, where are we going to put it? So in other words, the black and brown communities were the only place you could put this stuff. Right? That's what he was saying. We knew that. I was just shocked that he actually kind of came out and said it. So, said it. so but we'll, we'll, we'll see on both of them. I'm not keeping track. Here, yes, here, and then I, I see the young lady here, and then the young lady here. Okay. Um, this uh, law that government has passed, they think it's a terrorist law. Do they have any standing to take like, an industry on the edge of the census track that would then make it to the test? Great question. So, so the question was, does the law take into account that if, if you put something on the edge of a block group that's not an overburdened block group, but impacts that overburdened block group, right? Um, what, what would you do? And we don't know. It actually, we think the law will not. We don't think the regulations will cover that. We actually propose something like that to them. And by the way, that's a methodology question for EJ study. Because right, some early EJ studies, that was that was a problem. They just look at well, and still some EJ studies, you just look at the census tract is in of a black group, and so you know if it's right on the edge of a black of, of 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 a black group. How about and so you count it in that black group, 
Well, how about the block room next to it that's getting, you know, and all that's not counting? So the methodology now is you you draw a circle around the facility and you count that as part of whatever block group, you know, is within that, that circle. But so we'll see. We suggested that, but I, I don't have a lot of confidence that's going to happen. Um, and we'll see how it, how it how it plays out. But if we think that's going to be a problem, that we can get this initial reg regulations out, then we'll see if they need to be need to be changed. And the yeah no no okay. oh no I think it was the young lady here. <laughs> So, um, are there uh, declarations uh, of the in this model or more no. environment um, no. justice? No. And then what is the 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 Side of EJ. Uh, we, we have some support from environmental movement in New Jersey, but we figured just, you know, that's cool, but go to our base. That's you know, those are people we represent. And we met with one group and they brought that up. They said, well, we're really interested in EJ and reparations. We're like, okay. <laughs> uh, don't know what that looks like, but we're down. Um, the second question will they go to other? States. That's a great question. Maybe we don't know. We don't know. That's always a question of it's the same question. That's always a question of a local EJ community fighting. You know, will they just go because we don't want them to come to New Mexico or like in Pennsylvania, the neighbor state? And I think you know, the only solution we come up with that is we hope other states will start adopting this too, like New Mexico. <laughs> And we're getting calls from, from a lot of a lot of states actually. But that's a question in the mandatory emission reduction policy also. Um, that I recognize, you know, I said we need to work out. If a plant in the EJ community reduces its, its emissions, and it may be that it could be that the only way I'm getting off track, but I'll just say this. It could be the only way to reduce emissions from some plants is to shorten the, the um, operating hours. So does that mean it's going to produce electricity and some other plant have to run more? So that, that's something we have to look at. Uh, science. Now we have it. You know we have it. Been faced by scientists saying this is crazy. Some in the business community started saying that, but we you know we had examples of good people. We said no, no. Look in California. That's been better. Look in New Jersey. You know we, they've already put it, put it together. And there are two or three other states that have these have these green tools. 
So, you know, we were like, it's already been done. You can, you, you can do this. And the organizing, you know, obviously the organizing has been a slow burn over years. You see, we started 2007. <laughs> and we, we kind of kept going. And we developed a policy based on what the communities were coming to us for. A lot of it was air pollution, incinerators, sewage plants, um, garbage transfer stations. Um, I'm missing. Um, I'm missing something. Oh, oh, power plants, right? Um, uh, we do a lot of stuff around diesel, diesel, diesel. <laughs> Happy to hear that. Uh, so uh, we, you know, we did a lot of direct organizing in Newark when we first started with the municipal ordinance. The statewide policy, we just kind of kept at it, and we were. The organized, I think, was really on a national level when we did the Booker Bill. And that kind of moved to the state level. And we got a whole lot of these organizations in, right? Which you know, I almost called. And we were ready, and I think we were prepared. You know, we had this thing on our policy for years. So when, when the opportunity came, and I should also say politics, right? In, in New Jersey, we were going to get a bill passed. We were a little bit surprised it was brought up. But part of it was that our progressive government in New Jersey um, was starting to get black from black folks. And the black folks were saying, we voted for you and you're not doing enough. And by the way, he just won by the skin of his teeth. I think he won. I, I got to look at are they still going back and forth? No, that was this morning. They settled down now. Okay. How long it takes to process the absentee? Well, you know, because uh, any, anyway, the districts that were out were from North Jersey, where he's probably going to get votes. But, you know, black, black folks are saying, you're not doing enough. And we think one way he showed he was doing enough was through our law. He actually announced it in support on Juneteenth. Yeah. <laughs> Which, I almost said, no, 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 you can't, you know, we can't do it. But, um, and then we were really arguing in, uh, with the state about the definition of overburdened community because they want to really restrict it. And we want to be as protected as possible and have as many communities protected as possible. And we were going back and forth and we were kind of winning the argument, but the state was still arguing about several points. Black Lives Matter movement. I swear to you, this has been recorded. I gotta be careful. Um, <laughs> the Black Lives Matter movement made a difference. I'll, I'll say that. Politically, and, I, and, and you know, and, and let, let me look, the state's taking chances. Let me be complimentary. Politically, I'll say it allowed the state to do some things that they couldn't do before, I think. The Black Lives Matter movement. And we definitely saw movement on the bill after the Black Lives Matter movement. So I'll, I'll you know, I'll be generous because these, these are good folks. It allowed them to do stuff they wanted to do and that we wanted them to do <laughs> for years. Exactly. So maybe we'll see a demand to a misreduction policy too. Thank you. Uh, Professor B, I think we got people on the on the on the Zoom, on the yeah. virtual. But let me let me let me just let me just try to quickly uh, get us here. Um, one, I wanted to thank those that are that are virtually joining this session this evening. Um, and as as Professor Bia mentioned earlier, they're from all over the country. Um, and many of those, I will say, are members of our net of our network, the Environmental Justice Health Alliance for Chemical Policy Reform. And they're in Kentucky and Virginia and many of the other states, California, Arizona, Nevada. I mean, you name it, we got grassroots groups all over the country. So I just want to just go back. Now, some of the things that were mentioned um, earlier, um, sawmill, the sawmill neighborhood was, was, was mentioned. Now, I don't want to go deep into this because at the end of the day, uh, we all carry a lot of history here in this room. Right? But we were very, very active in the saw, sawmill community with the residents of the sawmill. Now, I just want to be totally transparent. At one particular point, the city was saying, there's nothing we can do about this situation. 
And we kept saying, there's something you can do about this situation because other situations you seem to find remedies for. You're talking about product? But when it comes to our community, many times there's nothing we can do about this situation. So whether that's in the sawmill, the saw dust that was coming out, out, of, out from the sawmill itself, um, in the sawmill neighborhood, um, and then the health impacts on those residents that were living there. So I'm, I'm gonna keep it very, very short. The other one was, and Dr. Sheets made a comment to this, was the incinerator, okay? Now we, we, we um, know that at the end of the day, that incinerator that was located in Sunman Park, New Mexico, very, very clear, that medical incinerator that was located in Sunland Park, New Mexico, that was impacting the health, safety, and well-being of our primarily Chicano, Mexicano community. There's nothing we can do about that. Now, what I will tell you to remind us, that incinerator is not in operations today. Now, going back just for a minute, when in the Mountain View community, when some of the contaminated soil from Mountain View was being cleaned up and transported to another location, I'm trying to go where Jane was going, um, and we asked, it's not just about the Mountain View community. We're not in anybody's backyard except ours. That's not what this movement is based on. We asked where the contaminated soil was going. They said that they couldn't tell us. Mm -hmm. So and part, of the, part of the response I just wanna say is, how did we find out at the end of the day where that soil was going? Because we followed the trucks <laughs> to Monroe, Louisiana, to one of the most largest African-American communities with an extremely large landfill that was going along with it. And that contaminated soil was being taken to another community of color. Mm -hmm. Lastly, the way that we've been dealing is because being a grassroots organizer, activist, community member, radical, whatever we get called, at the end of the day has never been an easy mission for any of us. And I say that to you because partially the city, and government, the state, and other entities seem to find solutions to issues when it's someplace else. Now, the reference was made to that. If everything is so safe that's being located in our community, then why don't you put it up there? Why don't you put it out there? Now, when I'm pointing, you know where I'm going. Huh? If it's so safe, at the end of the day, then put it there. We know it's zoning issues and permitting issues. No one needs to tell us that. But we also know that things change when it supposedly comes from a higher income community, a better or more so-called educated community, and there's reports, historical documents that prove the fact that in this city and in this state, and that's there. So at the end of the day, we don't need to be over researched and that we've got to do this and we've got to do that. The statistic, as Dr. Sheets said, is already there. The question is, do you want it? Now, my last point is this. There's nothing from Richard's opinion or from Los Adinas' opinion that the county, the city, or the state you could do some things and you're going to get an uproar because then we missed something that Dr. Sheets stated earlier. We're talking about total participation and the decision making and those solutions that for, come from the bottom up. So I'm going to leave it there because I want to turn it over. I do get a little excited, you know what I'm saying? And, and I'll be real honest with you, many times. I don't only get excited, but I get pissed off, okay? <laughs> and I say that because for those that have given up their lives, which I've said, our sisters and brothers, our people 
that have given up their lives to make it possible, which I said in the beginning, is what our struggle is all about. So it's about building and making our communities whole again. We're not a special interest group. Nope, we said, well, at the end of the day, it's about being, you're a special interest group. How can the special interest of the health, safety, and well-being and the lives of our people be, we ain't asking for anything different than anybody's been asking for. So I wanna leave it there, but I wanna, I wanna congratulate, I mean, not congratulate, but I just wanted to bring to the table, Dr. Villa, uh, those that nationally, locally, statewide, and nationally also zoomed in here and thank them very much for that. Thank you. So Anyone who dares to look at the time, you have all heard your 1.5 hours of CLE. Um, and I don't want to pull at anybody, but I, I actually think that if we want to take some more questions, is that still okay? Oh, uh, sure. Okay. Well, um, your questions and the floor is still uh, still open. I have a question. Um, I think it's for the city. Um, you would EHE, the Environmental Health Department, support a rule? Requiring cumulative air impact analyses for permits in low income communities and communities of color. Yes. That might be helpful. I'm not sure. So I'm going to defer to Karita. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, when I uh, talked at the beginning, I mean, and I, you know, don't want to like, ask in front of everyone in case you have a different answer, but I just want to do what you guys did as at least a starting point. And, uh, Let's do it. Let's get to the legal battle part of it. Yeah, I think we know we're gonna do it. So yeah. I mean I don't feel like I'm speaking out of turn because of my policy. Um I wanted to talk about what happened in Mountain View recently about an air permit that was allowed um in what seems like it should have been denied. And they're trying to get I'm trying to think what it's called, is that environmental impact that something similar about the impact when something comes up for permit? Um, what, what, what's the expression? What uh, term do you want to use? What? Renewal? No, the, 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 besides an environmental impact, we always wanted, we also wanted a health impact or some other yeah, health impact assessment. What? Health impact assessment. Health impact assessment, and, and it didn't happen. And they are they approved this, what was it, an asphalt permit? In an area that already had a lot of pollution, I'm not sure. Then something that I think we kind of work to make something so that doesn't happen next time. What would that be? Not exactly familiar with that permit. Um, which which one? The, the, the exact <laughs> details that you're talking to me from yeah, the city. Know, just, um, a lot of people worked on it from small from other organizations. I'm not sure. I can, I'm happy to give you my heart card and touch base about that one. I'm yeah, not sure which one. Are you that same? Yeah, I'm actually with it. Yeah, oh. it happened recently and was part of it. No, it did. And, and, and Magdalena and Laudo and a lot of the who are residents of Mountain View, along with other organizations, uh, have been engaged in it. Um, do you all want to make any comments to that? Laudo or Magdalena? The only thing I'd like to <clears throat> suggest is that anyone who's interested in working on cumulative impacts, any legislation or any policies, uh, maybe uh, Sophia can take down your names, your phone numbers, and your emails uh, so that we can move forward together as a larger community. We're kind of like the, uh, the soul warrior down in the South Valley trying to get things done. And we've been working on it for many years. When uh, Cliff first came to New Mexico, I took him on a tour of Mountain View. And we'd certainly be glad to take folks on the tour of Mountain View so that you can see all the different kinds of contamination that are out there and all the cumulative uh, collective stuff there. Whenever anybody does a permit request out there for construction or whatever, we, we always get the same story. Well, we can't look at anything else other than that particular permit. We can't take into account any of the other contamination that's already taking place that people are bringing. So we can certainly give you a presentation 
or any of your groups or organizations and let you know what's going on in that particular community. I know that the North Valley, Garner Denver Neighborhood Association, uh, San Jose Neighborhood Association, and other, other communities throughout Albuquerque, the metropolitan area, but also other parts of the state. So we can either work on the local or we can work on the statewide, but we need to work. And I appreciate anything anybody wants to contribute and dedicate their time and effort along with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I do want to say that um, I, I am a, a liberal non for many years and still work in my community. And I think that my quality board has always disappointed the community. I mean, almost every permit, whether it's in Mountain View or the state, that has to do with the facility gets approved. Mm -hmm. And the, the Rhino decision, which only dealt with solid waste landfills, was it has kind of been the only legal decision that says that you have to. Uh, take in other considerations other than, than technical questions, right? Because, uh, for example, a landfill in northern New Mexico that, uh, that an organization I worked with for many years, I mean, they pay $110,000 for the permit to to uh, NMEB, right? Or this was in 10 years ago, but it cost NMEB over $100,000 to review the permit, right? Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, it takes three years to actually get the permit. So NMEB helps the facility through the whole process of the three years. The community learns about it when the hearing happens, right? So by that time, the state has invested hundreds of thousands of dollars and they basically look only at the technical aspect of the permit. And typically I would say that people did that research, you would find that over 90% of the time, the permits are just given. So the RINO decision is again, that only applies to solid waste regulations, but it should be taken to other regulations that you need to consider uh, social kind of conditions, not just the technical part of it, because of course the technical part of the permit's always gonna be filled in the way the government wants it to if you work with them for three years, right? And then the public comes in, and well, we haven't been working with the NMEB for three years, we're not their friends, we haven't been going out to lunch, we haven't been sitting at meetings with them, so we just come in as angry, disgruntled people all the time who usually don't have all the facts, right? And so it's a real it's a real challenge. And then today's society, for whatever's going on today, there's very little pro bono assistance out there. So I really look to all of you students that are here that you really look to um, to look to begin to, to build up that again. I mean, was that something of the '60s? This doesn't happen in, in the technocratic age when we have so many uh, things. And then language, do I want to really address that because we're creating a bunch of. Uh, you know, that whole idea between science and, and social conditions, right? Well, you can quantify a lot of scientific stuff, but you can't quant quantify race, right? Because it's been always the legal issue with race in the legal field, right? So we need to begin to look at things a little bit different. And as Dr. Sheet say, said, the window is open a little bit now. We need to push the word R, racism. And we need to put, because the diversity and inclusion of the problem is, yeah, we, be careful what you ask for, right? We wanted them, they served the purpose for a while, but now oftentimes we think that they're saving, are they now serving the purpose of being the gatekeepers, right, in our communities? So there's a lot of issues that are challenging our communities right now. And having the language is good, but we need to practice that. Because having the language, you know, we hear a lot about deconstructing and decolonizing, but where's the practice, right? And so whether it be the city lawyers or any kind of lawyers or any kind of academics or anybody else, it's like, it's really the practice and the applied research that is, that's important. And again, recognizing that not everything is quantifiable. Racism is hard to quantify or premeditated uh, conditions for racism, right? So that basically lies on your shoulders as, as legal. Exactly. We're getting close. You know, to happen to, to finish the list. Did we have any any questions that that, that we're seeing or comments we, coming up from we do. I can read one question. Um, hey, the synapse is still there. I'm reading a question I'm on the chat. If that's okay. Um, in the New Jersey ordinance, I think this is for you, Dr. Sheets. Who has the burden of demonstrating that there is no disparate impact of stressors on a community when there is a new permit application? Is it the permit applicant must prove that there's no disparate impact, or is it the community that actually has to prove that, that burden? Uh, that's a great question. Well, the applicant, 
has to do the analysis. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I wouldn't think of it in terms of, in, in, in terms of who has to prove the burden because the, 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 you know, the analysis, I guess it's kind of a central analysis. I'm, I'm trying to avoid kind of go into <laughs> it, it, the, the analysis involves counting up the number of stressors in the in the block group where the facility will be located. They're above the 50 percentile on the state level. And if if the number is above the state average, you do not have a permit. If it's below, you don't. Is it above the state average or the county in which the facility would be located to? So I don't know. I'm going to throw it back to you, Professor Vida. I guess I would say if you ask me that question, since the facilities are the ones doing the analysis, and you wanted to look at it in terms of the burden, I would think you would say they have the burden of proving that it's not a disproportionate impact. But the way it's done is so technical, <laughs> you know. It's like you count it up and that's it. Yeah. You know, it's just not like you're not like you're going through an argument. Either you're above the number or you're below the number, and that's going to determine, you know, whether you get the permit or not. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? Sure. Um, you, and you mentioned it in your comments. One of the questions, I think you said that the regulations are as important as as the statutes. Yeah. And yeah. I think some of the early sort of analysis we've heard of the new newer fixed uh, ordinance is that. There, it may be a great law, but the, the staff who are supposed to implement it, it don't understand what they're supposed to do um, in, in terms of this implementation. Mm -hmm. have, have you already started to think about training or you know, yeah. working with staff so they understand the law was, and, their re, and the responsibility in that? You know, it's not so much, well, several things. First of all, the on the city level, and I was really interested in what you said about you now have, it sounds to me like the municipalities can pass laws. You say it can pass laws that are stronger than feds. We don't have that in New Jersey. So in New Jersey, the cities are preempted, you know, by the state and federal law. That's why we really were counting on the state law to, you know, give it teeth. But that's not saying there's not a role for the city. The problem, one of the problems, this is why we want to analyze it, but one of the things we see right off is that it's not that the law is not um, understood, but that the people we had said who would move the law forward, which the Newark Environmental Commission, didn't have the capacity and the resources. They don't really have the capacity or struggling with the capacity to do that. Mm -hmm. And so then the question is, uh, well, several questions. When, when we wrote the model municipal ordinance, we actually said that the city should hire what we call a public advocate to, you know, to really enforce the law, but that got dropped out when, you know, when it got passed in Newark. So either we try to give the Newark Commission more resources, environmental commission, to do that, where we where those resources come from, or should some other part of the city be responsible for really moving the law forward? But you know, then our whole concept was. We wanted to be that the people moving it forward within the city, we actually wanted them to be a little bit insulated from city government, to tell you the truth. That's why we said hire public advocates. That's why we put the Newark Environmental Commission, which are you know people, volunteers doing it. So that's a little bit of a dilemma. And that's one thing we have to think about with the law. Good question. Um, how about two more questions? <laughs> I think one, two, and three. One, two, and three. Okay. <laughs> and we'll try to keep some snappy answers. Yes. So, um, I was wondering if you all use health data like OSB rates, asthma rates, um, any other reference that you could use to measure how you assess the rates apart from the impact of the product that you found. So those are not in the definition of overburdened community. It's just race, income, and linguistic um, isolation, um, linguistic proficiency. But uh, and I 
should have, because my memory is so bad, I should have had a slide with 31 stressors. And at least one or two of those have to do with our health stressors, common memory stressors. So that goes into determining whether there's a good Okay. Mark? Thank you, Dr. My question is about advice to the American Lyme Department as advocates um, for identifying people with a little bit of clinical. And we've been hearing from oil companies throughout the decade reassured clinical practitioners about environmental justice impact of the part and the second part of the deck. By saying that any new disease that you found on EPAC phase three may sound like you're doing an 11 mile radius around with three people, right? The implication being those three people are clinical. Two miles and we're out there with 11, no, that was four miles, but then mm -hmm. two miles out there with only 11 people. So, how do you, what advice would you give to the environmental department in a very rural state uh, for identifying yeah. environmental justice? That's a great question. But you notice in New Jersey law, that would have made a difference because it's percentages, mm -hmm. right? So, the density, maybe it should make a difference, but just, <laughs> you know, but. So that wouldn't be an issue in, in New Jersey. But the question you asked, we're talking about within WeJack, um, because there's going to be a screening tool used to distribute benefits, justice pointing, a whole other topic we want to go into. But it's been that that is a point of debate in developing these screening tools in the EJ community now that that Richard, when he came to talk to his class on teaching, actually brought up. That we, we want to make sure when we develop indicators that we capture those rural communities that are overburdened or vulnerable. And so I'm not going to say exactly how you do it. I don't know. Smarter people than I can, can figure that out. But we are debating that. What indicators do we need to include in the screening tool so, so that it will you know, capture the, the rural communities that we want to capture? Um, and that's a question just on a regional basis too. Like if you put some indicate when you do it on a national level, you put indicators, maybe they're maybe it'll work well in the east, but it won't work well in the southwest. And, and how do you how do you address that? So I don't have the answer for you, but I want you to know that's been flagged as an issue and people are working on it. One more, okay? Yeah, this is more <clears throat> more for the city. When you look at the cumulative impact. Of pollution, and I, and I know this isn't all about the air force, but is there any chance that you consider things like noise and like groundwater pollution and like soil contamination? And I'm thinking of the San Jose neighborhood as an example. You know, you've got GE aircraft in Eastern Drive there, you have the Gulf Terminal Drive there, you've got the chemical plant up the hill, and there's, there's some pretty serious groundwater contamination, some pretty serious soil contamination. And and you have the, the air pollutants in the air, you got emitters there. You have the railroad, you have the rail yard there, and the trailing fence by the rail yard really doesn't stop the noise from the rail yard. You know, we talk about health stressors. And, and I know it might be a complicated question, but I, I think yeah, that's my best advice. That's something. Well, I'll let these guys off the hook since they actually have to do the work and make the rules, but I'll say for, for my state, this is part of that bigger irrationality that we have to get to a point where we can address, because I know they would probably said something about where we have jurisdiction and the sources of our authority and the, the statutes that give us the ability to deny permits, and then there's a different set of laws that decide where we put land uses, and then we've got the county and the city and the you know, separate board. In the San Jose area, and probably some of them want me to talk about the sound wall that we're investing in. But I mean, I think the answer is like that's definitely the right answer. <laughs> so the question is, what are all the things in the system that have to change that we are allowed to talk about those things together? This is a question for way smarter people than me. But uh, I just don't want to, like, I don't want to lose what you're saying just because it seems really hard because that is the Question. Um, 
appreciate that. So I really don't want to hold people any longer uh, than they already have. We're, we're well over time. I think this is a very constructive conversation. Thank you to everybody who has come here. Thank you to the city. Thank you to all the neighborhood organizations, the advocates. Thank you to our amazing guests. We have this, uh, this session recorded. If you'd like a copy of that, please send me an email. If you'd like a copy of the New Jersey law or ordinance, please just send me an email and we'll reply to that. We really want to stay in touch. Thank you, Lauda and, and, and others who've spoken. We really appreciate all the work you've done all this time. And thank you all for coming. Thank you.